Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine, and I'm here with Rob and John. Hello. What's up? And John is going to share a story. I will let you introduce it and tell us why you picked it, and then um, go ahead and read a section. All right. Uh, I picked um, How to Become a Writer by Lori Moore. Actually, this is a story that uh, a friend of mine recommended. I hadn't read any short stories for a long, long time, and she said, oh, you should read this one. It's really good. And so I read it, and that's kind of what got me into reading short stories again. Nice. It also got me to buy this book, and I kind of built a syllabus around this, not around this story, but I included this story in a syllabus for a class I taught. So uh, so why I picked it is, um, I picked it for that reason, because it was, you know, a memorable story that that I thought might be interesting to talk about. Awesome. And what part are you going to read here? Um, I'm going to read one of the sections near the beginning. I think it's like the fourth, third section. As a child psychology major, you have some electives. You've always liked birds. Sign up for something called the Ornithological Field Trip. It meets Tuesdays and Thursdays at 2. When you arrive at room 134 on the first day of class, everyone is sitting around a seminar table talking about metaphors. You've heard of these. After a short, excruciating while, raise your hand and say diffidently, Excuse me, isn't this birdwatching 101? The class stops and turns to look at you. They seem to all have one face, giant and blank as a vandalized clock. Someone with a beard booms out, No, this is creative writing. Say, Oh, right, as if perhaps you knew all along. Look down at your schedule. Wonder how the hell you ended up here. The computer apparently has made an error. You start to get up to leave and then don't. The lines of the registrar this week are huge. Perhaps you should stick with this mistake. Perhaps your creative writing isn't all that bad. Perhaps it is fate. Perhaps this is what your dad meant when he said, It's the age of computers, Francie. It's the age of computers. That's all we get. My dad told me that when he listens to this and we read a snippet, he's always sad when it stops. Is that right? Yeah, so I don't know what that means about the rest of the podcast, but... (laughs) That's true. Yeah. I think it means we're picking good stories. Let's hope. Oh, that's good. So you told us kind of why you picked it, but why do you like it? Well, it's about how, how about being a writer, and it just a lot of it rings true as far as being a writer. So I like uh, that aspect of it. It's like it's a story for writers, which apparently has wider appeal than merely that. Right, right, right. <laughs> so... So that was one one thing that stuck out to me, obviously, when I first encountered it. And then it's told in that kind of um, that you, the second person. Yes. Which is interesting. And I thought that might be fun to talk about. So that's that's why. Have you read this author at all? Are you familiar with her actual? I no, not really. I, I think I might have read one or two other things, but not real. Not I can't say familiar. Yeah, I'm not either. And I wasn't sure if. Her descriptions of her writing, especially when she was a younger author, are super self-deprecating or kind of spot on. When she's talking about how she has no concept of plot and everyone says so, it's this refrain throughout her early years and everything explodes, it sounds like, at some point. People die, couples die in their kitchens all the time. (laughs) Or our main. <laughs> All of that sounded great. What I took away from that, not having been familiar with this author or read her, was that she's obviously, at, at least at this point in her life, very self-aware, which I really appreciate. I don't think you can pull off a story like this with the humor unless you have that, obviously. But the self-deprecating humor is some of my favorite kind. And she even talks about her boyfriend having this kind of cynicism that she mistakes for humor at that age. I was like, that's me. (laughs) It seems like self-deprecation can either go two ways, or maybe it goes two ways all the time, that you're either really literally self-deprecating or reducing yourself, or you're kind of like showing off your scars as if like, yeah, I got this one and nom. Check this one out. And there's a lot of pride and kind of self-satisfaction in it. And I see more of the self-satisfaction in the story, which doesn't mean I like it any less than I do. I really enjoy the story. But it's fun to see that. I th- We can hear dogs right now. <laughs> it's fun to see someone who's can kind of play the other side because usually it's easy just to be like yeah i was such a dope when i started out writing and these stories were silly but i think the whole the whole occasion of the story is just to be like i'm awesome now and it's so hard but i made it and you can kind of laurie moore is a name out there i mean she's not obscure this is like a fully functioning operational really cool writer so for her to come out swinging the first thing to say first try to be something anything else kind of what's missing from that is try to do anything else because i can do it and you probably can't which i appreciate because that's fun and you want to see someone who's Who's better, who's better than you? Yeah, I think this came out pretty early in her career, though. Yeah, 85. This is the one. Yeah. Which is an interesting, like, here I am. and Yeah, here I am, but why did I even bother? <laughs> <laughs> I liked it for that reason, and we can talk about the writing itself, 
too, but I liked reading it as a writer, like you said, John, because I think the most important lesson from, from this would be a good one for young readers or like inexperienced readers or people that have dealt with rejection at any level or maybe repeatedly. And she's saying, despite all of that, she can't even help it. She keeps coming back to it. And that was, I think, what I identified with most. Like, maybe in college, I had a better sense of plot. You know, I wouldn't be self-deprecating that way. But I think a refrain among writers would be that we're like masochists somehow, right? You toil away on your own and then what? Nobody reads your shit or wants to publish it. And you keep doing it. (laughs) In what other profession would that be acceptable? Like her mom is even saying, what are you doing? Actually, one of my thoughts while I was uh, rereading this for recording was, uh, I was wondering, well, the the question was, could this be about like a air conditioner repair person? Oh, sure. Or could this be about a lawyer or something, you know? And I don't, obviously, it doesn't seem like it could be, right? And and that's an interesting question. Like why, Oh, why would it, can, does this have to be a writer? Because I think in this space, and that's why I said that for new writers, I think it would be encouraging. In a creative space, your success is very much subjective. If you're a surgeon and someone dies, we can objectively say that part of that has to do with you. Mm -hmm. But what constitutes art is in the eye of the beholder, and there's some schmuck out there that's going to think your work is great, even if it's your mom, and there's merit in that somehow. So the difference here maybe is that she wants to do it as a career, and that's kind of the path the story takes, why she keeps coming back to something that she's kind of objectively, at least financially failing at. (laughs) She's not getting published or she's not getting paid or people aren't reading it, but she can't help it. This is what she wants to do all the time. And she's got that college counselor that says, well, you need to be doing what you're spending most time taking courses Mm -hmm. in. This is like a love story. Yeah, that's that's good. And there's she has no allies in the story. (laughs) Everyone's against her, even partly herself's against her too, even though I do think that she's kind of humble bragging throughout most of it in in a really fun winking way. So it is see this it's fun to see a character who literally everyone's against her (laughs) and sort of the way the story wraps up the last line she mentions her date and she gives like a really writerly description and it's kind of like a final triumph like she's sticking the flag into the ground and saying i'm still a writer here i'm going to end this story about how bad it is to become a writer with like a beautiful line that you would see in a novel or Mm -hmm. a, a great short story so it's, I, it could have taken two routes where she, I mean, we, obviously we know she's a writer. The writer who's, who wrote this is a working writer. But to see her end it so, again, in such a triumphant way is nice to end on a high note with something that starts off telling you don't do this. Right. And that moment it mirrors uh, previous ones, like with her mom. Like every time she tries to share something with somebody, like here's a thing I made, they're always, they change the subject. It's, uh, can you en- empty the dishwasher? <laughs> or, hey, let's go get a beer. Or, um, and then the final one, he's like, he just kind of looks down at his arm and smooths out his arm hair so funny because i've done that <laughs> yeah that's a great just as an aside that's such a great way to show his reaction without mm-hmm. telling us mm-hmm. his reaction it's it's excellent so even though she's come to that place like you said everyone out no one else is there with her and it seems worse in her um in her creative writing classes where it seems like that's where she that's where people ignore her or ignore, ignore her stories the most where they want to talk about anything but the actual story they kind of want to dance around it and of course those are probably fun shots of just whether it's mfa programs or creative writing classes yeah. in general and i'm sure she took a lot of pleasure in doing that as i'm sure <laughs> other writers <laughs> yeah. have written about mfa classes have done too so it's cool to see that having not taken any classes really like that personally it's cool to see that just about anything is talked about but the story itself it's not taken on its own merits which is kind of which i would find frustrating which i find immensely frustrating but it's just taken on kind of preconceptions on what stories are supposed to be they're supposed to be x y and z plot they're supposed to be what are some of the other things that the the teacher tells her that she's not doing correctly i mean there's a litany of them have you earned this but does it work have you earned this cliche what do we care about this character have you earned this cliche that's a great line and sort of as like to combat that i mean this story itself is there's not really a plot to it it's more just like an argument or even a disclaimer against young writers so there's really no plot in this story we're not going from one to the other she's already told us what everything is in the first sentence yeah i thought that was really fascinating that's uh, one of the things i i wanted to talk about for this one is that there is no plot you know it's a story without a plot and um and yet it's engaging it draws us along i don't know it raises the questions of like you know what is plot the first question it could raise and then how do you make a story engaging without a plot right 
mm-hmm. which is um, which is what she's done. Which is what she's done. Yeah, exactly. And it makes you wonder how many writing courses have stifled really cool imaginations or just kind of out of the box ideas. And I don't have anything against MF. I'm, there's plenty of great writers that we all know that went to school for it. But I think, especially here, the criticism that I agree with having taken a lot of these classes, and even in our workshop, I feel like we fall into this, is that you especially don't want to do that when a writer's new and young. Like you're saying. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah, there's a time and a place to learn the rules, and it's not usually off the bat because that's never fun. No, that kind of dissuades you from what got you in in the first place. It was like, I love to yeah. read, it's fun. There's no rules when I read. Yeah. Exactly. And what you're writing at that age is not something that you're hoping falls into something like a genre. The question I hate, what genre is this? <laughs> yeah, that is annoying. Well, it's like, if you can't define it, number one doesn't matter. No, it really doesn't. That's why you hire an agent. You say, okay, agent, yeah. I don't know what this is. Go sell it. Yeah, a genre only matters when you're trying to sell it. And otherwise, when people tell me what they write... And they're like, I write. And then they name, you know, a genre you would find at Barnes and Noble. I'm like, cool, I'm not interested. Like, I want to read things by people who fail to describe them because there's something bigger than romance, whatever. But yeah, so I get what she's saying. I I really like that whole arc. And back to John's point about plot, I think it's at least chronological. So we get the sense, even if it's because the story has ended, that by the end, when she's done with college, she kind of has a few, like a montage clip there where she says, quit jobs, cash in bonds, or whatever. I don't know. She's talking about the kind of drastic things that she does to fund this lifestyle at that point of writing. And then she ends it, like Rob said, uh, this really nice scene with the date. And I think by the end, we're supposed to assume that she's arrived, but it's not at some pinnacle. It's just that this is her normal. This is writing for her. It's not having anyone that understands it, doing everything you can to make it work. I I felt like it had an arc at least. Yeah. I think everything that the story is, is in that title. It's how to become a writer. And the story is that it's, it's her becoming a writer. But it's not, it's not event driven. It's not a driven, like, like plots are usually like things that happen. And whereas this is just a character finding out who a character is, it's kind of a self discovery, kind of like, this is just who she is. And she comes to terms with that. And that's, that's the story. Well, I guess I like that even with that title, you might assume somewhere along the way that you would arrive at something like, and then I was published. And we don't even get that. You yeah, know, there's not, true. there's not a pinnacle moment, a capstone that ends that title. This is just her at a diner still facing people that don't get it or don't get her. But she, like you said, has realized that she's either okay with that or she's still a writer. Like someone said recently in our group, oh, I'm not, an, I'm a new writer or something. And I was proud of John and I because we were quick to say, yeah, you are. Like if you're writing, you're writing. You, you might suck. Sure, but but if you're <laughs> writing, you're a writer. That. <laughs> yeah, we didn't say that. But yeah, I hate when people say that because if you're writing, you are a writer. There's no other um, certificate you can get in this field. Some online class. Yeah, it's not like saying I'm a surgeon. Yeah. <laughs> Fuck you are. <laughs> Okay, so well, what did you like about the point of view? Because I really enjoyed that. The uh, the the first person, or what is it called? Second person. Second person. That's not the point of view, is it? That's um. Yeah, that's point of view. Okay. I think um. Okay, so apparently um, she herself calls this the second person mock imperative voice, where she's uh, apparently parodying self improvement manuals, which uh, oh, which is interesting. You know, once I read that, I was like, oh yeah. That's, yeah, that's what this that. is. But yeah, it's more than that. And I, it's interesting that, um, you know, in our lost episode, we, uh, we discussed the second person a lot and how you forget it's the second person as you're reading it because it's creating a character that's not you. It's not you, the reader. Um, it's you, the character. And this one has a name, unlike the other story we talked about, Francie. You know, this is about Francie. So we're kind of understanding this as a character. And I think, um, that's a, just a natural thing we do with fiction in general is, you know, a he or an I always become Comes a separate character than ourselves, and you does the same thing. It's, in the end, it doesn't really matter. It's just a stylistic thing. Right. But it does lend itself to this tone, which is oh, yeah. so fun. The imperative thing. Yeah. The, uh, decide that you like college life. Decide that perhaps you should. Like, just those um, uninflected verbs that are just commands have that force to them that you can't get in third or first person. So, right. Yeah. It's not she decided. It's you must do this thing next. It's almost like a uh, uh, choose your own adventure or something. Yeah. Yeah. And since um, second person seems kind of conversational anyway, that there's an intimacy to it 
And I think it might be reinforcing what brought her to become a writer anyways. No one else wants to talk to me, so it's me and you, reader. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Or no one else takes me seriously enough. And whether you're just talking, whether you're just writing into a mirror or there's actually, you're imagining a reader on the other side, which makes second person se- seem kind of lonely, la- lonelier sounding to me too. So I think that doubly reinforces it where it's it's just me and the page because there's no you present. When, when I read second person, I'm not really imagining the writer so much looking at me or talking to me, but just a writer alone in a room. That might be because I, I do it myself as a writer, but there's just kind of it seems the second person seems extra quiet to me if that makes sense yeah right i wonder if it's because in a lot of these pieces there's never another character that has as much weight as this narrator no it's dominant yeah i'm thinking of like the one time that i've used this recently and it was purely about me and was the entire time and that was the point of it it was supposed to be about me 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 but not me first person as as far as how i interact with my surroundings it's more Look at my personal revelation. That's what these are. I think these these probably are quiet pieces because they're not plot driven and because they're just in the character's head or something. We need a third example. I think um, if you think about some like stream of consciousness pieces are often told in this style where it's an interior monologue to the character them so they're talking to themselves which it's an interesting connection like this is you think of like a, a cartesian view of of um ourselves where it's like we have a pilot inside of our minds in some respect that pilot is speaking into our mind and telling us what to do right and so this is kind of like that this is the pilot speaking to us it's like hey you go do this go do mm-hmm. that Sure. In the same way that you would see in a stream of consciousness where those where pilot and character are collapsed into one where they're talking to themselves. And this is kind of like diving into the middle of that. I don't know. That's an interesting. I, I hadn't thought about that that way before. I really like this point of view and I think it should be used sparingly. But when it's done right, it's you can't imagine the story being told any other way. The, the point of view is so much the story itself. I've noticed with interviews with celebrities or whomever that people are more apt to use the second person when they're talking about themselves. I don't know if this is a recent thing or if this is or if this is something I'm just picking up, but it seems people seem to do it when they're either when people are asking admiring questions about themselves or they're talking about something that people might admire anyway, which makes me wonder, well, how does that apply here though? It's if you're ta- if you're using you, you're taking onus off yourself. That may relate to my initial point where it's, there's kind of a self self congratulatory element to her self deprecation. So you're kind of removing yourself by stepping out of the first person. You say, "Well, I'm I'm not going to take total um, ownership of this." Or well, it's easier, like you said, to distance yourself and then compliment yourself than it is to yeah, precisely yeah, brag, just full on brag. So where have you heard this then? Anywhere and everywhere, and pull up any interview with really? with a known person. And these celebrities are saying celebrities are really a loose term. Just really, it could be someone who's being interviewed for the local news. Okay. Well, you know, you do this, you do that. Oh, and, sure. I think, yeah, that's a, a natural storytelling. We do that reflexively and somewhere. I, I've, lately, I've been catching it. I'm thinking, why do we do that? I can picture it now in the sense of having, like, your example for the local news, someone explain their craft, like woodworking. And, yeah, well, you do it's this, simple, you, do. you cut the wood, and then you go like this. But I was thinking more when people are talking about something that they've done. Okay, so specific it's, examples. Some specific oh, example. I'm going to have to pull this up. Yeah. Somebody swims across the English Channel and says, all right, about halfway through, you get to this point exactly. where you feel like you have to turn back. Yeah. yeah. Which is more off-putting than I wanted to turn back. When you say you, it's like, I wouldn't be able to swim the English Channel. You're not, <laughs> right. you're not, a, you're on a different level than I am. So why are you trying to make it? It's almost more condescending. I guess then I wonder if, it's interesting. Um, for the sake of this story, it's only appreciated by writers. Probably. It's like you could speak that way to other people that had swam, swam, swang across swam the English swam. Channel, and they would then they would get it. Oh, this is a lot of fun. I think anyone would enjoy this. Yeah, I've read stories about professions I have zero interest in, and I still got enjoyment out of them. <laughs> All right, what else do we want to talk about for this one? Oh, I, I did want to point this out. I don't know really what to call it, but I like how. There's a couple paragraphs here that they're all dealing with her rejections, her struggles. And then at the end, it'll end with a sentence. So the two examples that I found were apply to college as a child psychology major. And that precedes the paragraph that you read, which says, as a child psychology major. (laughs) And then she does it again a little later on when she's, this is at this point, it's Oh, at this point, she's like having, she's gone through college and all of this. Anyway, um, she's talking about some conversation that she's had with like friends and ends the paragraph by saying apply to law school. And it kind of comes out of nowhere. And I think it's supposed to because the decision is not 
didn't make sense in her life then. It does make sense in the overall thing. She's just going to surprise you by saying, look at this other complete tangent I took my life on thinking that I needed to... I, and they're so funny, right? Which makes you wonder if they're on an equal footing with writing. Like, is, is, is writing... Is she just flailing away trying to be a writer too? Does that have the same weight as, I'll be a major, I'll be a writer? Which really builds the character nicely. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I thought those parts were so funny. And and I like this stuff too. Quit classes, quit jobs, cash in old savings bonds. Now you have time like warts on your hands slowly copy all of your friends addresses into a new address book vacuum chew cough drops keep a folder full of fragments and then she starts to list those fragments and i think here too is just a good kind of window into the life of a writer which is she's doing these things but she's doing them all through this lens of i'm a writer and and they're also not necessarily furthering her career quit classes (laughs) i like it yeah, you get the sense that that's kind of her telling herself, I wrote today, I vacuumed at Jude Cough Drops, and I wrote like 30 words that are all disconnected. Yeah, it's basically like how to become an artist. Well, what would you guys take away from this then, or copy? I think the, the idea of having a story with no plot. <laughs> um, I think that um, I'd have to, I don't think this one example is enough to kind of build a, a sense of what that would require, but it is something to... Um, to consider that you can get a lot done in a story, a lot of interest, generate a lot of interest, explore a character without having things happen is the wrong way to say it, but without having like a, a real well defined plot. Yeah, well, we didn't use this word, but is it an essay then? I think the difference between an essay and a, and a story is probably too complicated to really uh, describe because you can have a fictional essay, right? An essay that is a fiction that tells a story in some respect. So, I mean, you could think of it as an essay. I think that Moore's description of it as a um, the parody of the self-improvement manuals is probably, I don't know what you call that style. Like, what, what is, is that an essay? Is that a... Yeah, it's like Dave Barry. It's just, this is a funny thing and I've run out of space, so it's, it's over. Yeah. It's a column. It's a, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning humor columnist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. So writing things without plot, but what well, that's... I think the key to it, obviously, is without plot, you have to have character. You have to have a really strong, engaging character. So that's the where you start if you want to do something without plot. And then, you know, having them have some as interesting a um, characteristic as wanting to be a writer helps, too. I don't know. Wanting to be an AC repairman, and the AC repairman has a AC repairing block and can't <laughs> quite figure out how to repair an, an air conditioner. I don't know. <laughs> what about you, Rob? I like narrators that seem to have a bone to pick, or they have a grudge, or they there's kind of a chip on their shoulder, and it's fun watching them work it out one way or the other. And you can feel that attitude in pretty, I guess, the first sentence, really. First, try to be something else, anything else. There's like a panic. There's a desperation there that's really fun. And it's fun to see that unravel. So try to develop a voice. I mean, I'm, this isn't like an assignment, but what I enjoyed about it was w- just watching a character just deal with her shit <laughs> <laughs> the best way she can. Yeah, that's a good point. It's angry, but not so angry that it's off-putting. It's just like you said, I'm going to try to work this out. Well, I, I just like this um, point of view, and I've used it before, and I like I said, I don't think you can use it all the time, but I think it's one that we forget about because you can't sustain it necessarily for a long, drawn-out story. But occasionally, I think, if you wonder to yourself before you write something how you could approach it, there are going to be stories where this one, this point of view jumps out, and it's the best and only option. And I think maybe it's when, like Rob said, you want to remove yourself from something and, and tell a story maybe, or maybe it's more like, this is the only way I can force you to sit through a long, winding story with a revelation. And I think it works, especially if it's somewhat true. I think you kind of get off the rails if you use this and it's pure fiction. I feel like I've read characters or stories that have been done that way. And then it's like, where do you go from here? What's the point? But here it's, she's got this structure that her life actually took and she's going to take you through it through this lens of here, you idiot. Here's how you try and fail. And I know how to direct you because I've seen it all. So yeah, this was fun. Anything else? All right. Goodbye.